thank you very much. Once again, um, this is our third um, roundtable about Kelsen. Um, we are Juris North. Um, right now, we are uh, nine universities in eight uh, different locations here in the UK. Um, from Aberdeen to Westminster um, in London. Uh, we are lucky today to have uh, one of uh, two of our chairs, if I'm not uh, wrong. We have uh, Professor William Lucy from Durham University. I don't know if you want to say something, uh, William, and uh, Josh Hewitt or Dr. Josh uh, Hewitt from uh, Newcastle University, our latest addition to Juris North. So thank you in particular, uh, William and Josh for being here. Um, and this particular set of roundtables that will finish with the Congress in September uh, are organized not only by Juris North, but by, by two of our colleagues, Gonzalo Villarosa at Kiel University and uh, Dr. Jorge Fabra Zamora from University of Toronto. Gonzalo, Jorge, I don't know if you want to say anything. So I just want to thank everybody for being here and I'm really happy for the last uh, three sessions. Uh, as, as I had mentioned to Gonzalo and Jorge, we have seen a growth in Kelsen in the last in the Kelsen studies in the last month since we started. We have seen that other groups uh, have started around Latin America. Uh, Professor Lechowski participated in one. Imer is going to participate in another, and there is one new, a new in Brazil. And we are really really happy about that. That that we started this as will there be interest in Kelsen, and now we have seen like. A, a steady a growth in, in Kelsen study, like people were reluctant, and now we have seen a, a proliferation a, a, of Kelsen studies in Latin America, and we're really happy to, to be part of this motivation. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everybody for being here. Gonzalo, do you want to say anything? At this time, I would like to give a special thanks to Pro Professor Paulson uh, and Bonnie Lichewski Paulson for making this possible as well to my colleague Maria Gonzalez Solis, the student in Beach, Schleswig Holstein of the University of Kiel in Germany, uh, Jorge Nunez and Jorge Fabra for their support. And I hope you enjoy the video of this lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, very briefly, we'll have uh, the final event in September, or at least one of the final events, 24th and 25th of September. And I can see some of the speakers we'll have. We'll have an interview and thank you once again, Professor Paulson and uh, Bonnie Paulson as well, because we, we've already recorded, and thanks Gonzalo, last, last week we recorded an interview that they will show in September, and we have um, some other uh, of our friends. We have today Lars uh, Binks from Cambridge, he will be with us in September. Uh, we have Mary Skopke from uh, Oxford University, uh, Andres Botero Bernal from Colombia, uh, well, and several others. I'll send the information, you know, using the, the uh, Juris North distribution list. And of course, all our working uh, papers. We'll have three today. All of them will present in full in September. Um, how do we do things? Um, I was explaining uh, Professor Paulson before. This is Juris North, different from, and he's been with us. We've been lucky to have him twice already. We had Professor Paulson with William Lucy in, in Durham a few years ago, uh, face to face. Um, how do we do things? Uh, the idea we have only one expert today, it's Professor Paulson and the rest of us are simply souls, uh, not, not personalities, we don't play roles here. We are not professors or students. We are here mainly philosophers or legal philosophers to learn from each other. Uh, so sorry, Professor Paulson here, but I'm not sorry. We are entitled to ask you any question. Of course, we, we will uh, be conscious about the, the time limitations, uh, 30 minutes. Um, for the introvert, for the introvert, if you don't want to speak up, uh, simply write down your question or comment using the chat box and we'll uh, read that on your behalf. And for the extrovert, um, because we have many people today, simply open the mic and fire your question after the presentation to Professor uh, Paulson. The only thing, because we have so many people today, uh, please, uh, let us know using the chat box if you want to open the mic simply to put an order to the question. Um, and I think uh, that's all. Without anything else uh, from me to say, um, I mean, Gonzalo said it before, thanks in particular to Professor Stanley Paulson for being here with us, very kind uh, of you, and uh, for being with us last week as well uh, to, 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 to do the pre-recorded uh, video. Let us show and um, please, Gonzalo, Jorge, let me know if it's working. Is it showing? Yes. Um, 
Perfect, good. So I'm going to stop talking now. We'll uh, see um, Professor uh, Paulson's presentation uh, a bit more than 50 minutes. After that, we'll be opening for questions and answers. So thank you very much all for being uh, with us today. <laughs> Hello, welcome to this uh, round in the Kelsen Roundtable. My name is Stanley Paulson, and I'm pleased to be able to present a paper on Kelsen's norm theory, which, as I argue, has received very little attention in Anglophone circles. The name of my paper is The Stufenbau Yields Legal Powers, and the paper itself consists of four sections um, taking account of four developments beginning with his first major treatise, Main Problems in the Theory of Public Law, 1911, and culminating for my purposes with the second edition of the Pure Theory of Law in 1960. Let us begin with a brief look at the reception accorded to Hans Kelsen's greater legal theory in Europe and Latin America. Scholars in these parts of the world would have us believe, entirely correctly in my view, that Kelsen's greater legal theory breaks down into two general fields, a peculiarly non-reductive version of legal positivism and running alongside it, Kelsen's general norm theory. In contrast to the attention given to Kelsen's norm theory in Europe and Latin America, it has received practically no attention in the Anglophone world. Kelsen's norm theory is the focus of my talk today. Where legal powers are concerned, one looks to the Stufenbau, which serves in the work of the Vienna School of Legal Theory as the model for the legal system. The Stufen, as they are called in the Stufenbau, are levels, and Bau, B-A-U, is German for construction. Thus, literally, a Stufenbau is a construction of levels. It is well known that Kelsen adopts the Stufenbau in the form in which it had been developed by Adolf Julius Merkel, and I'll return to Merkel at a later point. The levels found in the Stufenbau serve as Kelsen's point of departure in explaining legal powers. The lower level norm, Kelsen writes, is conditioned by the higher level norm. If we rewrite this line in a more congenial idiom, it reads, the higher level norm is an empowering norm, and the exercise of the power it confers yields the lower level norm. Returning to Kelsenian parlance, this pattern of higher level conditioning norms and lower level conditioned norms is manifest in every set of paired levels in the Stufenbau going all the way up and down the hierarchy. Of course, these legal powers are not somehow peculiar to the Stufenbau. Legal powers are understood in this way in every system of public law. I invite attention to the Stufenbau simply because it represents Kelsen's scheme of legal powers, his scheme of empowering norms. There is a point here of general interest respecting the form of legal powers, and in particular how their form is determined by the legal system. I begin with a point of criticism stemming from John Gardner, to whom I reply. Gardner writes, and I'm now at the first numbered quotation, John Gardner speaking, 
It was once thought, notably by Austin and Kelson, that the best way to appreciate the question, what is law, is to begin with the more humble question, what is a law? Laws, it was thought, must have some properties in common with each other that distinguish them as laws, even when they are taken in isolation from other laws, end of quote. For the early Kelson, Gardner's claim is correct. Kelson's first major treatise in legal theory is the Hauptprobleme der Staatsrechtslehre, main problems in the theory of public law, and I will refer to the treatise simply as main problems. Kelson published his treatise in 1911, and there he offers a tidy formulation of his overriding thesis, namely, and I quote, that the question of whether the legal norm is to be understood as an imperative or as a hypothetical judgment is the question of the ideal linguistic form of the legal norm, end of quote. Thus, to repeat, Gardner's claim is correct for the early Kelson, but Kelson's adoption of the Stufenbau in the mid-1920s stands his early view on its head. Alfred Fredros, Kelson's colleague in the Vienna School of Legal Theory, gives expression to the significance of this development vis-a-vis -vis the form of the legal norm. Ferdras notes that the legal system, that is the Stufenbau, serves as the basis for determining the form of the legal norm. Thus, legal powers, empowering norms, are now front and center. Ferdras's point is correct, and it demonstrates the falsity of Gardner's claim. It does, at any rate, if Gardner purports to be addressing Kelsen generally. For Kelsen did not persist in theorizing about the form of the legal norm in isolation from the legal system. The adoption of the Stufenbau had major implications, ultimately leading Kelsen to recast legal norm theory in terms of empowerment. To pursue the Stufenbau further in these introductory remarks would have me ahead of myself, for it represents the second of four developments that I want to sketch in my exposition of Kelsen's norm theory. To begin at the beginning, still in my introductory remarks, I turn in the first development to Kelsen's rejection of the imperative. This has us looking again at Kelsen's treatise, Main Problems. Here Kelsen takes as his point of departure the two types of legal norm that are prominent in the work of his 19th century predecessors. These two norm types are the imperative, addressed to the legal subject, and the sanction norm, addressed to the legal official. Why does Kelsen reject the imperative? He believes that the imperative, along with the obligations imposed on legal subjects by its means, is infested with moral connotations. As we will see, Kelsen engages in concept formation as his means of escaping what he regards as a moral or ideological dimension of the law. This remarkable feat of Kelsen's emerges clearly in the later developments to which I will turn presently. As already noted, the second development is the Stufenbau, with empowering norms informing deliberations in the Vienna School on the form of the legal norm. The third development comes in the 1930s. It counts as a wholesale recasting of Kelsen's sanction norm, which had been understood as an obligation-imposing norm, that is to say, the imposition of obligations on officials 
to carry out sanctions. Kelsen now introduces empowerment in place of obligation. I am calling this his drastic shift. To appreciate the significance of the drastic shift, we have to return for a moment to the first development. There, as I noted, Kelsen abandons the imperative, namely the imperative addressed to the legal subject. It appears that this leads Kelsen to suppose, at least for the moment, that the imperative and with it legal obligation are eliminated altogether. But this supposition of Kelsen's proves to be mistaken. What remains from the first development is the sanction norm. And the rub, the sanction norm includes imperatives addressed to legal officials, imposing obligations on them to carry out sanctions. Thus, Kelsen's effort to eliminate the imperative, his effort in what I'm calling the first development, is incomplete. Only now, in the 1930s, is this serious problem met and resolved. To repeat, in this third development, Kelsen replaces the obligation found in the sanction norm with empowerment, relegating obligation to a derivative status. Finally, there is the fourth and last development. In the second edition of the Pure Theory of Law, published in 1960, Kelsen brings the various pieces in the greater norm puzzle together in what I will call a composite norm theory. In an altogether new scheme of classification, there are three types of legal norm. The complete legal norm, the independent legal norm, and the dependent legal norm. The complete legal norm replicates in miniature form the Stufenbaum. Empowerment serves as the fundamental norm modality. Before turning to the great, uh, greater uh, development uh, in the first uh, of these four developments, I must add a caveat. In my exposition, I will be claiming that Kelsen has developed a truly radical norm theory, which goes so far as to displace obligation as the fundamental norm modality by means of empowerment. The critic will surely want to object to it how can you say such a thing, Stanley, when it is easy to show that Kelsen's writings contain innumerable references to imperatives and with them the obligations they impose on legal subjects? My rejoinder is twofold. When, in the context of the official theory, Kelsen grants that there are imperatives imposing obligations on legal subjects, he is quick to add that such norms are, strictly speaking, fully superfluous. For they say to the subjects nothing different from what the sanction norms say to them. Kelsen's disavowal comes as early as the treatise Main Problems, and he is saying the same thing in virtually the same language in the treatise General Theory of Law and State, 1945. This treatise comes after Kelsen's drastic shift in the 1930s. I have a further reply to critics on this issue. Here I take as my point of departure a rejoinder by Joseph Ross at a conference many years ago. It was a conference on Kelsen's legal theory. Ota Weinberger, the distinguished logician and Kelsen authority, offered a textual counterexample to the claim being made by Ross. The reply by Ross is unforgettable. Well, Ross replied, Kelsen, at one point or another, said just about everything. 
And the point I'm drawing from Ross's rejoinder to Weinberger is this. There is a great deal of language in Kelsen's writings that tracks an altogether conventional view of legal norms. This can scarcely be missed. But one also finds the makings of the radical norm theory to which I am inviting attention. The latter is not precluded by the former. In a word, one has to separate the wheat from the chaff. The first development, 1911, the sanctioned norm as the sole norm type. Here at the beginning, it is well to invite attention to Kelsen's well-nigh visceral reaction to morality, at any rate, when morality seen as an ideology impinges on the law. This is already abundantly clear in the treatise Main Problems. Many years later, he offers an unusually lucid statement of his position. Short quotation, the pure theory of law seeks to free the conceptual characterization of the law from its ideological component by completely severing the concept of the legal norm from its source, the concept of the moral norm, end of quote. In the treatise Main Problems, 1911, Kelsen, looking to the 19th century tradition in legal theory, assumes that there are two norm types in play, the imperative, imposing obligations on legal subjects, and the sanction norm, directing officials to impose sanctions. These two norm types Kelsen assumes in the treatise Main Problems are together exhaustive of the possibilities, tertium non datur. The form of Kelsen's argument is therefore clear. If the imperative can be eliminated as untenable, what remains is the sanction norm as the sole norm type. Kelsen proceeds by taking aim at the well-known imperative theory of Carl Binding, which Binding had developed for the criminal law. Binding's position, which counts as a reflection of 19th century imperative theory, comprises two norm types, a hypothetically formulated sanction norm addressed to the legal official and the imperative addressed to the legal subject. The first of Binding's norm types is indistinguishable from Kelsen's own sanction norm, as Kelsen presents it in the treatise Main Problems. Kelsen says as much in a statement in which he summarizes Binding's position, and I now add numbered quotation two. Kelsen speaks, and I quote, it is well known that the core of Binding's theory is the distinction between the criminal law norm and what Binding terms, by way of contrast, the norm. Binding's criminal law norm has the very form that, according to the view I, Hans Kelsen, have presented here, is essential to the sanction norm. It is a hypothetical judgment about the will of the state. Indeed, since Binding is focused only on the criminal law, the will of the state to punish. Binding believes, however, that alongside this sanction norm of the criminal law, a second norm, legal norm must be assumed. It is the imperative or the you ought to do thus and so, requiring the subject to behave in accordance with the law. Binding dubs this the norm, end of quotation. In taking issue with Binding's imperative, Kelsen addresses several arguments. I will confine myself to one of these arguments, namely the argument from the illegitimate metaphorical use of language. 
Binding uses familiar language to give expression to the lack of compliance with an imperative. One transgresses a norm, violates a norm, breaks the law, and so forth. He writes, for example, that, and I quote, the lawbreaker can only transgress the norm that prescribes the rule for his behavior, end of quote. Kelsen replies to Bending with a curious thesis. He contends that the metaphorical use of an expression whose literal use has no legal application is, in a legal context, illegitimate. The literal use of the expression to transgress is directed to a limit, and to transgress the limit is to exceed it. This literal use, according to Kelsen, has no legal import. Thus, Kelsen concludes, the metaphorical use of to transgress is illegitimate in a legal context. This use is parasitic on the literal non-legal use. Kelsen applies the same reasoning to the expression verletzen, meaning to injure or to violate. In its literal use, to injure or to violate is directed to a body, in German Körper. And this use, according to Kelsen, has no legal application. The metaphorical use of the expression in a legal context is parasitic on the literal, non-legal use, and is therefore illegitimate. As Kelsen summarizes his position, the norm, quote, you ought not to steal, is no more violated by a theft than is the norm, if you steal, the state will punish you. How does Kelsen's argument speak to Binding's imperative theory. It purports to rule out the very language we use in giving expression to violations of an imperative. It goes without saying that Kelsen's argument, adduced to make the case against bending, does not succeed. The lady doth protest too much, methinks, and the Shakespearean line bespeaks Kelsen's effort. Why would Kelsen take such a tack, leading to an altogether counterintuitive position? The explanation stems from his overriding concern that the objective law be insulated from every incursion of morality. The second development, the Stufenbaum. As I noted in my introductory remarks, Kelsen adopts the Stufenbaum in the form in which it had been developed by Merkel. It is well then to begin with Merkel. His paper of 1931, Prolegomena to a Theory of the Hierarchical Construction of the Law, is far and away the best known of his writings and his most extensive statement on the Stufenbau Doctrine. Still, just as with his earlier statements, Merkel regards this work as provisional, and the title, Prolegomena, suggests as much. In a footnote at the end of the 1931 paper, Merkel states that a monograph is being prepared on the Stufenbau Doctrine. Regrettably, no monograph in this vein appeared. Kelsen adopts Merkel's Stufenbau doctrine hook, line, and sinker, giving initial expression to the doctrine in a paper of 1924 and then in his major treatise of 1925, the Allgemeine Staatslehre, or General Theory of Law. Thereafter, the Stufenbau doctrine is prominent in all of Kelsen's major treatises up to the end of his classical period in 1960. Part and parcel of Merkel's Stufenbau doctrine is the dynamic conception of the law, the idea, and I quote, the law governs its own creation, end of quote. 
one can give expression to their dynamic conception of the law as Merkel and Kelsen understand it by looking to the systematic ambiguity of the verb to issue or the substantive issuance. From the standpoint of the higher level norm, issuance of a lower level norm, say an administrative regulation, is law application. That is, the higher level empowering norm is applied. From the standpoint of the lower level norm, the issuance of the administrative regulation is law creation. The exercise of the power conferred by the higher level norm serves to create a new norm. The effect of this dynamic conception is to relativize the difference between law application and law creation and thereby to relativize the standing of the different types of law, constitutional law, statutory law, administrative law, and the like. Legislation, the standard bearer of fin des positivist legal theory in Europe, loses its privileged position, and its doctrinal rationale, stat statutory legal positivism, Gesetzes Positivismus loses whatever standing it may have had. The third development, empowerment qua modality of the sanction norm, the development of the 1930s. This major development has Kelsen shifting to the modality of empowerment vis-a-vis -vis the sanction norm. He invites attention to the shift in a lengthy paper, and I'll return to the paper a bit later. The sanction norm is no longer understood as a hypothetically formulated obligation, but as an empowerment with obligation relegated to the status of a derivative concept. This prepares the way for the last development, which is properly understood in my terminology as a composite theory of norms. Kelsen presents it, albeit in piecemeal form, in the second edition of the Pure Theory of Law, 1960. As I noted above, Kelsen, in his early work, does not address the issue of the modality of the sanction norm. He proceeds in the early work without explicitly taking account of the hypothetically formulated sanction norm as depicting the legal official's obligation to impose sanctions. In main problems, as we saw, Kilson is in agreement with Carl Binding on this issue. In the 1930s, however, everything changes. Kelsen arrives at an altogether different view, arguing now that the sanction norm is fitted with the modality of empowerment. Building on this notion and further work in the 1940s and 1950s, Kelsen argues that obligation is properly understood as derivative. It stems from a coupling of empowerment norms at adjacent levels in the Stufenbau. Commentators on Kilsen failing to appreciate the radical character of his norm theoretic position speak invariably of officials being directed to impose sanctions. And H.L.A. Hart is far and away the most prominent example of a commentator on this issue. This view is correct for Kelsen's work up to the shift in the 1930s. To be sure, his dramatic shift to empowerment at this point was unknown to all of us until in the late 1980s, his paper on empowering norms drafted in the 1930s as a reply to George Sell was at last published. Of course, the dramatic shift was there from the beginning in General Theory of Law and State, 1945, and in the second edition of the Pure Theory of Law, 1960. But until Kelsen's reply to Sell was published in the 1980s, readers of Kelsen were not looking for a dramatic shift.
and so did not find one either. Two moves of Kelsen's mark the breakthrough to empowerment as the modality of the sanction norm. First, in his study of Sell's theory of public international law, Kelsen introduces the hypothetically formulated sanction norm as an empowering norm and characterizes legal obligation in its terms, namely as a function of the power or competence to impose sanctions. Specifically, and I'm now at numbered quotation number three, Kelsen is speaking, and I quote, there is a possibility of basing the concept of legal obligation on the concept of competence, a possibility of tracing legal obligation back to competence. That is, if the legal obligation of an individual to behave in a certain way is recognized as given only if, in the event of the opposite behavior, another individual is empowered by the legal system to impose a sanction on the first individual, and furthermore, if the empowerment to impose the sanction counts as competence, then the legal obligation of the one individual rests on the sanction imposing competence of the other. End of quotation. The second move comes in Kelsen's General Theory of Law and State, 1945. Here he brings his reading of ought into line with his introduction of empowerment as the modality of the sanction norm. That is, Kelsen is now reading ought as akin to a variable expression ranging over the familiar modalities of obligation, positive permission, and empowerment, where these are now regarded as dependent legal norms. Kelsen develops this view in general theory of law and state, and in particular in the second edition of the pure theory of law. In general theory of law and state, Kelsen writes that the hypothetically formulated primary norm, Kelsenian parlance, the primary norm addressed to the legal official is the only genuine norm. Even where a secondary norm again, Kelsenian parlance, a secondary norm addressed to the legal subject is introduced for the sake of a representation of law, Kelsen notes that this secondary norm is certainly superfluous in an exact exposition of the law. This language is of a piece with Kelsen's earlier talk in the treatise Main Problems, on the sanction norm as the sole norm type. And Kelsen's message thus far is familiar from the earlier work. He endorses the primary norm as the only genuine legal norm, labeling the secondary norm as, strictly speaking, superfluous. The change that emerges in general theory of law and state is Kelsen's reading of the ought in the primary norm. In the treatise Main Problems, the modal auxiliary ought, the English language counterpart to Kelsen's verb sollen, is used by Kelsen to express an obligation. And ought, in Kelsen's hypothetically formulated primary norm, is understood in the treatise Main Problems as imposing a conditional obligation on the legal official. In general theory of law and state, 1945, Kelsen defends a different view, a view that reflects the radical shift. He contends, albeit less than clearly, that the ought need not coincide with the concept of legal obligation. Rather, the ought of the primary norm serves as a placeholder akin to a variable expression. It might be termed a generic ought, which ranges over the modal verbs that govern dependent legal norms, namely can, may, and, turning now to the specific reading of ought as distinct from the generic reading, the ought of the command. 
In representative cases, the generic ought, the ought of the primary norm, indicates that under certain conditions, a sanction can be imposed. That is to say, an official is empowered to impose a sanction. What of the case where there is also an obligation to impose the sanction? Kelsen replies, and I'm now at numbered quotation number four. Kelsen speaks, and I quote, Under the present definition of legal duty, the legal norm which obligates the subject to refrain from the delict by attaching a sanction thereto does not stipulate any legal duty of executing the sanction, of applying the norm itself. The judge, or to use a more general expression, the law applying organ, can be legally obligated to execute the sanction in the sense in which the subject is obligated to refrain from the delict, to obey the legal norm, only if there is a further norm which attaches a further sanction to the non-execution of the first sanction. This is a clear reflection in 1945 of Kelsen's radical shift. These details of Kelsen's empowerment doctrine are not entirely clear in the treatise General Theory of Law and State, but he pursues the doctrine further in the second edition of the Pure Theory of Law. I'm at numbered quotation number five, and I quote, Kelsen is speaking, if a delict specified by the legal system is committed, then a sanction specified by that legal system ought to be imposed. Here the term ought covers both the case in which the official is only empowered to impose the sanction and the case in which he is commanded to do so. End of quotation. When is the modality of empowerment called for, and when the modality of the command? Kelsen answers clearly on that quotation number six. Kelsen speaking, and I quote, the imposition of a sanction is commanded, is the content of legal obligation only if its omission is made the condition for a sanction. Where this is not the case, the official can be taken only to be empowered to impose the sanction, not commanded. End of quotation. Where an official's failure to impose the sanction is itself understood as the condition for a sanction, then condition is shorthand for the antecedent of the completive hypothetically formulated sanction norm empowering a still higher official to impose a sanction on the derelict official. It is fair to say that Kelsen accomplishes his professed goal. The hypothetically formulated sanction norm addressed to the legal official is Kelsen's sole norm type, already in the early work. Then, thanks to the impact of the Stufenbau on Kelsen's deliberations, he comes to an appreciation of the role of empowering norms. And then, at the midpoint of his classical period, he answers the question of the modality of the sanction norm. It is an empowerment. Moreover, Kelsen's basis for conceptually distinguishing the law from morality is abundantly clear at this point. It turns on his introduction of empowerment as the modality of the sanction norm. It is juridically distinct in character, unlike the deontic modality of obligation, a modality in the law that it shares with morality. Where once the drastic shift has taken place, one has occasion to speak of an obligation, namely the official's obligation to impose a sanction. Kelsen explains this state of affairs by means of a coupling of empowerment norms found on adjacent levels in the Stufenbau. 
Thus understood, obligation is a derivative notion understood in conceptual terms without any appeal, whatever, to anything impinging on morality. The fourth and last development, Kelsen's composite theory of legal norms. Kelsen's evolving norm theory in the 1950s can be pursued from two quite different standpoints. From one standpoint, the norm theoretic problems that occupy Kelsen in the 1950s are problems posed by deontic norms, a development best illustrated by looking to Kelsen's work on the problem of conflicts between legal norms. Indeed, the pulling and hauling on this front led ultimately to Kelsen's throwing overboard the entire pure theory of law, as we know it from his classical period. The result is the so-called Schwedler, or late period, in the last decade of Kelsen's life. A conflict, say, between a norm commanding A to do X and at the same time a norm commanding A to forbear from doing X means that if party A should comply with the first norm, he violates A ipso, the second norm. Obviously, the same predicament arises if A should choose to comply with the second norm. If this is Kelsen's new program, a preoccupation with the niceties of deontic norm conflicts, then it would appear that what he developed earlier in the name of empowerment is no longer of interest to him. To proceed in this way, however, would be ill-considered. And this becomes clear when we turn to the second standpoint respecting Kelsen's work on norm theory in the 1950s. This standpoint invites attention to the systematic rubric in Kelsen's evolving norm theory in the 1950s, what I call his composite norm theory. In a word, he incorporates deontic norms into a scheme governed by the sanctioned norm qua empowering norm. My task in this last section is to show how this scheme of Kelsen's is to be understood. Two rubrics are thematic, and I should indicate at this point that there is a fair bit of machinery that I want to get out onto the table, but I will illustrate in due course how all of this machinery fits together. First, there is a tripartite distinction directed to the standing of legal norms as dependent independent or complete. Within this tripartite distinction, there is another tripartite distinction, the latter comprising the three species of dependent legal norm, namely command, positive permission, and empowerment. Empowering norms turn up here as dependent legal norms that speak to norm issuance, Parliament's issuance of general legal norms, as well as in private law, the individual's power to initiate a legal proceeding by filing a legal complaint. By contrast, the empowering norm understood, as per my talk about the drastic shift, is an empowerment found at the core of the sanctioned norm representing an independent legal norm, or if fully filled out with all of the conditions in place, a complete legal norm. And I will illustrate this scheme in due course. The expression standing is used here in an altogether literal sense to address the issue of whether the norm in question stands alone. Dependent legal norms are dependent by virtue of not standing alone. By contrast, independent legal norms stand alone, and a fortiori for the case of the complete legal norm, which represents a mirror image, albeit in miniature, of the Stufenbaum. The familiar example of the dependent legal norm is the command, which requires that the commandee carry out, 
or forbear from carrying out a certain act. If compliance with the command is not forthcoming, the result is a delict, which for its part triggers the sanction norm, more precisely, the empowerment to impose the sanction. The independent legal norm is represented by Kelsen's standard sanction norm addressed to the legal official. The generic ought takes as its basic reading the empowerment, and in keeping with this, Kelsen is careful in some of his statements on the independent legal norm to note that the ought need not be understood as saying that the sanction norm prescribes a sanction. An independent legal norm is not to be understood as prescribing a sanction. That is, the independent legal norm empowers the legal official, but does not impose an obligation unless, familiar from Kelsen's drastic shift, the official's failure to impose the sanction counts as the condition for a further sanction for whose imposition a still higher official is empowered. The dependent legal norm and the independent legal norm, Kelsen writes, are essentially connected. For example, the paradigmatic dependent legal norm, the command, is a legal norm only if it is essentially connected to an independent legal norm, the sanction norm. Given the essential connection between the command qua dependent legal norm and the sanction norm qua independent legal norm, the question arises, what becomes of Kelsen's claim in the treatise's main problems and in the treatise's general theory of law and state that the command is superfluous in a reconstruction of the law? The query is not anachronistic, Kelsen claims, Superfluity in the case of the command in the second edition of the pure theory of law as well. But the command qua dependent legal norm can no longer be squared with Kelsen's long-standing claim of superfluity. The important point is that the command qua dependent legal norm now has a place in Kelsen's composite norm theory. Thus, the imperative or command is no longer the villain in Kelsen's piece, for legal science has given it a status, albeit a derivative status. Enough on these elements of Kelsen's, on these elements of Kelsen's composite norm theory. It is high time that we have a look at a complete legal norm. Merkel's example of a complete legal norm stemming from Austrian law is a bit richer than Kelsen's examples. In reproducing Merkel's example, I have designated those dependent legal norms that qualify as empowering norms of issuance with letters between square cornered brackets. At the base of this depiction of a complete legal norm, at G, we find an independent legal norm. And to repeat, the greater complex comes as a complete legal norm. I'm at quotation number seven, my last numbered quotation, and Merkel speaks. I quote, A, if an organ called by the federal constitution to initiate legislation has introduced a bill in the National Assembly to the effect that the seller of certain wares is to pay a tax amounting to a certain percentage of the proceeds from the sale, and further, B, if the National Assembly, first in committee and then in a plenary session, in the procedures specifically prescribed by the parliamentary rules of order, has passed a bill to this effect, and further, C, if this legislation has been submitted to the Federal Assembly, which either raised no objection within eight weeks or decided before this deadline to raise no objection, and further D, if the Federal President has signed this legislation and the Federal Chancellor, as well as the Federal Minister of Finance, have countersigned the presidential signature,
And further E, if the federal chancellor has published the signed and countersigned legislation in the federal statute book, and further F, if after the effective date of this legislation, the tax official designated in the statute has prescribed in a certain procedure payment of a certain tax by a certain individual, and finally G, if this certain person has not paid the prescribed amount within the prescribed period, then the tax official, uh, I beg your pardon, the tax penalty ought to be imposed on this person." End of quote. The complete legal norm can be understood as a mirror image of the Stufenbau, the hierarchical structure of the legal system, albeit a mirror image in miniature. The complete legal norm moving downward through the hierarchy culminates in a single independent legal norm whose formulation is found, as I noted above, at G in Merkel's example. The command in Kelsen's norm theory, a dependent legal norm, leads to and is analyzed in terms of the independent legal norm at G. It is found at F. A closer look at Merkel's language in his example is illuminating. At B, the procedure set out in the parliamentary rules of order is prescribed for the Schreiben in the sense of being stipulated. Here we take our cues from the notion of empowerment. This is to say that a failure on the part of the National Assembly to follow this procedure could well mean that the National Assembly does not succeed in doing what it has been, in principle, empowered to do, namely, pass legislation. But no sanction is attached to this failure. It is simply the failure to draw on the empowerment qua issuance, a dependent legal norm. By contrast, at F, payment of a certain tax is prescribed in the sense of being ordered or commanded. The difference here is that the failure to pay the tax satisfies the condition for the imposition of a sanction, and the independent norm at G represents precisely that condition. Understood here is Kelsen's idea that the generic ought in the independent legal norm flags an empowerment to impose a sanction, unless, as explained earlier, the failure to impose the sanction is itself the condition for another independent legal norm that empowers a higher level official to impose a sanction on the first official, in which case the initial ought is properly read as a prescription in the strict sense. The other clauses in the complete legal norm also give expression to empowerments. For example, in A, to say that an organ is called by the federal constitution to initiate legislation is to say that the organ is empowered by the constitution to do so. Similarly, for the remaining clauses, none of these empowering norms stands alone. They are dependent legal norms in the hierarchy of the complete legal norm, culminating in an independent legal norm that empowers an official to impose a sanction. A large question arises straight away. Why is it that the empowerment to issue norms, itself a norm, cannot stand alone? Apart from its scheme in the complete legal norm, I believe that Kelsen's answer here takes him to the fundamentals of his legal philosophy. A legal norm is independent, and by the same token, a legal norm is complete, only if its coercive dimension, the coercive act specified by the independent legal norm, is manifest. Since the complete legal norm includes at its base an independent legal norm, 
this condition of Kelsen's obtains. Since the empowerment to issue norms, that is, the dependent empowering norm, does not by itself satisfy Kelsen's condition, it must be relegated to the status of a dependent legal norm, a mere fragment, as Kelsen puts it at one point, which is essentially connected, he says, to an independent legal norm. The other context in which empowerment arises as a dependent legal norm is that of the individual's power to initiate a legal proceeding. If Kelsen writes, A's failure to carry out a legal obligation to B is met by B's initiation of a legal proceeding against A, this counts as the exercise of a legal power by B, specifically B's empowerment qua dependent empowering norm of issuance. This is to say, Kelsen continues, that B has a hand in bringing about the ensuing judicial decision, the creation of a judicial holding, what Kelsen calls an individual legal norm. The point here lies with the nature of the judicial holding, the individual legal norm. Assuming for the sake of the example that B prevails in the proceeding, the civil action culminates in a judgment against A, and the execution of the judgment represents the coercive act specified in the independent legal norm. B's empowerment is essentially connected to the independent legal norm reflected in this instance in the individual legal norm that directs the imposition of a sanction, the execution of judgment against A. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, all. Wonderful presentation. Thank you, Professor Paulson. Um, and in particular, thank you, Bolsano Villa Rosas, uh, because he's been in charge of uh, the editing and it's, it's spectacular. I, I, I cannot say anything else. Thank you very, very much, both of you. Um, without further ado, we'll open for questions and answers. Um, before we do that, so I give time uh, for people to start um, writing if uh, we have an order. I don't know, Jorge or Gonzalo. Um, I wanted to say something we usually say, and again, we are still recording. Exceptionally, we are going to be recording the questions and answers today because we have several uh, legal philosophers uh, around today. Um, I wanted to say as well thank you to, to Professor Thomas Olechowski to, uh, because he's here, he was our first uh, speaker uh, for this set of roundtables and then uh, Professor as well, uh, Monica Saleska, I've seen her as well, she's here with us today. So we have all three uh, keynote speakers uh, today and some of the ones that will join us in September. Uh, we are dedicating with Jorge and Gonzalo, we decided we are dedicating this uh, roundtable to three people. My mentor back in Argentina, Dr. Maria Teresa López, uh, late Dr. Maria Teresa López from National University of La Plata, who I had the pleasure to um, have her classes about Kelsen back in the 90s. Uh, to late John Gardner as well from Oxford University, because um, 10 years ago we were, some of us were in Oxford attending his uh, event about Kelsen. Um, and uh, lately, uh, Professor Eugenio Buligin from Argentina, Universidad uh, de Buenos Aires, for all three, uh, this is dedicated. Um, and I think I'm going to stop talking and I will open for questions and answers. Are you there, Professor Paulson? Yes, indeed. I'm here. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, Bonnie, as well, because I know she was behind the cameras. So thank you very much, <laughs> Bonnie, as well. Um, well, let's start with who wants to open, because I, I, I don't have here, I can see a lot of comments. Uh, who wants to start with the first question so I can keep track of the order? Any first question? <laughs> 
Anybody, please, if you want to open the mic. Imer, I can see Imer, yes, perfect. Thank you very much, gracias, Imer. Thank Imer you. from Universidad of Mexico. It's UNAM, National University of Mexico. Hi, Stanley, congratulations on the presentation and congratulations to Bonnie. I, 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 I completely see that she's behind. And, um, Thank you very much. And let me just ask something, which I, I'm all, I always get like a number intrigue, especially on the Stufenbach. Uh, it's clear that it's uh, related to Merkel. And as you know, this idea of the pyramid is very uh, knowable in, in, in Latin America. And it's always tricky to find, figure out if either Merkel or Kelsen did use the word pyramidal, pyramidical, pyramid at some point, or it's mainly the, transla the, the translations from, from Latin Americans, uh, especially we'll say Mexicans. Uh, the other option it will be an Egyptian who also has pyramids, referring to the, the, to the stuff about in the, in the pyramidal order. But clearly the, the idea of the hierarchy, that's, that's, that's the main point in, in here. And that's why I think, uh, and I like very much the idea of Kelsen that all the acts are both creating and applying. They, they are applying the, the higher order and they are creating into the lower orders. So in, in that sense, I think that's very clear from my point of view on, on Kelsen, but I would also like to ask, so one part is, do, do you know of at some point using the word pyramid or not? And the second will be, do you know someone who is critical of this idea of Kelsen making the, 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 both, the two parts, the, the application and creation at the same time? And how do, does this relate to, to, your, to your general point on the empowering norms? Uh, Professor Paulson, if you want to answer, and I'll keep track of the questions, is that okay? Yeah. You're, you're muted now. Your microphone, Professor. You have to unmute yourself. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly well. Thank you. Yeah, um, Emma, I, I'm not sure about your first question. Could you perhaps repeat the first question? More than a question is, 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 is uh, do, do you recall or do you know if ever at some point either Adolf Merck or Hans Kelsen did use the word pyramid, pyramidical, the, the pyramid, to explain the Stufenbach, to explain the hierarchical uh -huh. order? Uh -huh. Or is it, do you think it is a translation? It has been or translation from Latin American countries, which is very helpful to understand the hierarchical structure, the, the Stufenbach, it's very easy to explain it. In, in, in decreasing lower there's higher and lower. So, so that's that's the question. If if you think he ever used the word, either Kelsen or Merkel or not, uh, or if you agree that it sounds more like a, a translation issue from the Latin America. Yes, I understand. And can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yes um, uh, to well, my well. knowledge, uh, it must be a translation. That is, in what I know of Kelsen and Merkel, I've not seen this expression. Um, the other question I think was uh, clear from the beginning, uh, application and creation. There are some, of course, who argue that, uh, the sh um, that one ought to draw a sharp line between the two. I think at the time, uh, Merkel first and then Kelsen following Merkel um, wanted to eliminate a sharp distinction between law creation and law application. The best historical explanation goes back to the fact that Merkel in particular was combating um, statutory legal positivism. And it's very interesting that in the forward, the new forward to the 1923 printing of Fain problems that Kelsen in that forward indicates that he, Kelsen in main problems, 1911, was himself a representative of statutory legal positivism, which of course we can't take literally, that would be absurd, 
but it did shape um, theorists' conception of the law. And Kilsen suggests that he too had been hoodwinked at that early point by statutory legal positivism. As I say, I think the most interesting uh, aspect of the denying of the sharp distinction between them is to relativize the distinctions between constitutional law and statutory law and the like. Um, that was, I think, Miracle's uh, purpose and kills and then follows through with the so-called dynamic conception of the law. Perfect. Thank you very much. We, we have several other questions. So, Imer, if you have any other comments, I'll, I'll, I'll put you right. Perfect. Thank you. Gracias, Imer. Uh, Wei, Wei Feng from Beijing. Are you there, Dr. Yeah. Wei Feng? Hello, Stanley. Yeah, how are you in Kiel? So my question is very simple. That is about the concept of imputation or in German words, to hash long. Yeah, so according to my understanding, imputation is a concept by Hans Kelsen to interpret the category of art or Zollen. And inception is a very specific collection between legal condition and the legal consequence. So I'm curious about the concept of imputation uh, and its relation with the long theory of Hans Kelsen. That is, how does this imputation works to uh, in relation to the empowerment or in relation to the dependent and the independent law? So that is my question. Yes. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, Professor, yes. Yeah, good. Um, there are, as you know, way two readings of um, imputation, so-called peripheral imputation, which is what you're asking about, and earlier central imputation. And central imputation has Kelsen, at least in, his, in the first round, taking his cues from Kant, the attribution of a legal property to an individual uh, Kant using that uh, concept in moral philosophy. But you're talking about peripheral imputation. There the parallel is to causation, uh, or so Kelsen would have us believe. And the imputative link between, as you rightly say, antecedent and consequent, the link being formed by the ought the German Zollen, the link is explicated by appeal to neo-Kantian transcendental philosophy. Um, and if one can follow Kelsen there, then Kelsen would have us believe you have a basis for pointing to a link between antecedent and consequent in the legal context that compares with the link in the causal context. And I think it's interesting that Kelsen at several points make something of that parallel. Perhaps he makes a good bit more of it than some of us would be uh, happy with. But I think he's keen all the way along the line to defend the proposition that the legal science is a bona fide science. And uh, with that in mind, the parallel to uh, causation uh, is uh, grist for his mill. Thank you very much, uh, Faye. And uh, wait, sorry, I, I, we have a question. I'm going to read Anna is asking, Dr. Anna Teichlin from Canberra, Australia. I, I'm conscious, thank you, Anna. I'm conscious it's very late. Uh, may I ask about the potential classification of basic norm within the classification independent or complete? Uh, so I wonder, Professor Porson, I think she wants a, a bit more, uh, you know, of your understanding about this classification, independent or complete. The independent legal norm is uh, the basic uh, hypothetically formulated norm, and the so-called generic ought is the ought that um, 
ostensibly links antecedent and consequent, and the basic reading of the generic ought is can, and the reading with the coupling to a second uh, uh, empowerment is the ought in the classical sense of Stanley. obligation. Stanley, um, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think they're asking about the Grun norm. Where, and, how will you classify the Grun norm? And and if you're talking about the basic norm, then we're we'll take leave of the independent legal norm, move to the classic uh, to the complete legal norm, and the basic norm then is found at the peak, at the apex of the complete legal norm. And in fact, both uh, Merkel and Kilsen um, speak in these terms that at the very uh, top of the pyramid, coming back to uh, Imar's language, at the very top of the pyramid, you have uh, the basic norm. If one is not inclined to follow Kilsen and Merkel on the basic norm, Merkel was somewhat skeptical, but of course Kilsen defended the view for many decades, uh, you can see constitutional law at the apex. But the basic norm uh, in the official uh, rendition of the complete legal norm is there at the apex, at the top. Perfect, thank you very much. And a guilty pleasure to have Professor Bix making clear the question that was honestly Thank you very much. It's a guilty pleasure. Uh, Dr. Jorge Fabra from Toronto. Yeah. Are you there? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a really interesting talk. I, I get that the core of the paper it could be put in terms of the egg-chicken metaphor. So it, 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 uh, early Kelsen was a chicken theorist, but Kelsen should be understood as a... Uh, no, sorry, early Kelsen was an egg theorist, and, but Kelsen should be understood as a chicken theorist in the terms of empowerment goes first over duties. But if that is the case, uh, where do we leave uh, Kelsen's reflections on primitive societies or societies without officials? What can we say about societies that do not have officials and uh, about, uh, in particular, whether there is an empowerment rule of some kind empowering society to provide legal uh, norms of some kind? Yes, I'm very sorry. I had a visit from my a favorite person in the world, Bonnie Paulson, um, and uh, she's telling me to sit back a bit further from the um, computer with its microphone. And that led to my missing virtually everything in your question. So could you start over? Give me the question again. This time, Bonnie is not uh, any longer uh, standing next to me, so I can concentrate on the question rather than on her. No, so the question is about, uh, since the key idea of the, of the paper is, uh, is that empowerment norms take priority over uh, duty imposing norms of some, what can we say about uh, societies without legal officials, societies or, or primitive law societies? So is there some kind of empowerment law, empowerment norm for, for, uh, for this kind of primitive law, which were also part of Kelsen's uh, attention? Uh, two points in response. You're right, of course, that Kilson, particularly in the late 1930s, um, conducted research on what he called primitive law, and in fact published a great big book on primitive law. Uh, the problem, second point, second point, the problem is that Kilson is not prepared to recognize this material as uh, constituting a legal system in his sense. Uh, for want of um, a basic norm, uh, for want of uh, the categories uh, of law that he introduces in connection with the basic norm. And he's very clear on this in his response to Eugen Ehrlich, because Ehrlich, of course, was concerned with uh, various forms of customary law, and Kilsen insisted that he had no basis uh, for talking about that material as law, unless these presuppositions were in place. And in short, a hard and fast line in Kilson's work between uh, so-called primitive law on the one hand and the real thing on the other. Uh, thank you very much. We have Dr. Asia Stroke from Barbados. Asia, are you there? <laughs> 
Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly well. Thank you, Asia. Okay, thank you so much, Professor, for your brilliant talk. I have a very basic question about translation. Some English speaking scholars challenge the translation of the German word norm by the English word norm. Uh, I think it's, if I'm not mistaken, it's Raymond Wax who speaks about that. And their concern is that the word norm in English has more sociological than legal connotation. So norm is something when someone acts normally as opposed to acting abnormally. So when someone follows some kind of patterns that are widespread in that society. While uh, the German word norm means uh, something that English speakers would rather call rule, a legal rule or provision, legal provision. So do you believe that this concern is legitimate or has the word norm already become probably due to chaos and a term of art at least among english-speaking legal philosophers so what do you think on that thank you well thank you very much it's an interesting question particularly in view of the fact um, that many of the analytical jurists in the anglophone world are now using the expression norm in place of rule and someone as close to um, um, Hart's legal theory as uh, Kramer is, who's written uh, repeatedly about Hart and in 2018 with the Polity Press in Cambridge, a whole book on Hart's philosophy. And he announces at the outset that he's not going to talk about rules as Hart of course did, he's going to talk about norms. And that led to some speculation on my part how did that get started? And I'm speculating here. It's not something that I can claim to know. And I've not done any very careful work here. But my guess is that the influence of Joseph Raz's work played a role here. Raz, of course, spoke from the beginning about norms rather than rules. And Raz's work, as you of course know, has been enormously influential. And people have been taken with Raz's work, uh, parts of Raz's uh, terminology vocabulary, and this, I think, is the most dramatic example. If I come back to your uh, initial remark, you're right, of course, that before uh, this shift in very recent analytical jurisprudence had taken place, norm was not seen all that often in English language context, and where it was, it usually referred to some kind of standard. Um, and um, that, of course, is not what Phils and, and the others in, um, in Europe and in Latin America meant by norm. I think insofar as the translation is concerned, even if uh, Kramer and the others hadn't shifted from rule to norm, I'd be reasonably happy staying with norm because it is of course um, a well-entrenched um, figure of speech in Kelsen's work. And it would be kind of hard to find anything uh, that would, uh, work as well. And it was Roz, I think, at one point many years ago, who indicated that norm is, uh, for some purposes, a rather more convenient expression than rule, because we can talk about norms, not only with respect to general laws, but with respect to individual uh, judicial holdings, for example, they too are norms. And you cannot do that, of course, with rules. A judicial holding is not a rule. It might become a rule, but at best, uh, when the uh, judgment is handed down, it's a ruling, but not a rule. Um, it's an interesting question, and I want to uh, thank you for it, and uh, gives me a chance to mention this rather remarkable shift, I think, in the Anglophone world from rule to norm, so that even the followers of Herbert Hart are now talking about norms rather than rules. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Asia, Professor. We have, can, can we take five more uh, minutes from your time? Of, five, of course, minutes. I'm having the time of my life. Perfect. Thank you very much. One thing I wanted to say in connection to um, Asia's question, when I used to teach back home in Argentina, I used to teach the difference between a legal norm and a rule. A rule is a technical, technical legal norm. So again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to take too much time, but I used to make that difference in Spanish back in Argentina. Uh, between a legal norm and a rule. Uh, but we'll, we can talk about that, Professor Paulson, later. Um, Monica Zalewska, Dr. Monica Zalewska uh, from Poland. Are you there? Yes, I'm there. 
Thank Hello, Stanley. Good to see you. Um, I'm sorry, I have very bad camera. That's why this angle. I have a question about uh, Carlson's uh, attack on using metaphors uh, when it comes about legal science. So I'm curious because in my opinion, my impression is that Carlson uses a lot of metaphors himself, uh, starting from Stufenbau. So my question is whether Carlson really has something in mind that there are good metaphors and bad metaphors and there is some criteria to distinguish one from another, or perhaps he just needed to attack the competing view uh, to defend his own view and that was just his attack on on metaphors. This last remark of yours is in keeping with what I would want to say on the matter. He was uh, bound and determined uh, to show that uh, Binding was wrong in defending the imperative as a distinct norm type. And I said a bit about that uh, in my talk, namely why Kilson was so concerned here that uh, uh, runs the risk of bringing moral elements into the law. And of course, that was anathema uh, for Kelson. It's a very odd argument in the context uh, that I spoke to, uh, to suggest that um, the metaphorical uses of terms uh, that have no legal import in their literal uses is illegitimate. It, it strikes one, of course, as being um, at the very best uh, a question begging uh, move on Kelson's part. Uh, there's no argument there. There's simply um, the bold assertion. Uh, when I was in your country, um, the suggestion was made by um, Maciek that uh, one could regard these uh, positions of Kelson's as stipulative definitions. I thought that was a very friendly move, uh, an effort to rescue Kelson from what appears to be um, uh, a very, very bad argument, if you can dignify it by calling it an argument at all. But he suggested that maybe we should think of these um, positions of Kelson's vis a vis uh, metaphorical uses of language as stipulative definitions. In any case, um, it is, of course, a bad argument and not uh, persuasive at all. And Kelson's other arguments in response to Binding are no better. I think his willingness to go with these dubious arguments, and of course, Kelson was one of those rare birds in our field, uh, an authentic genius. He had to see that these were bad arguments, but they, they were a reflection of his uh, determination to uh, um, show that um, bending was mistaken. Thank you very much, Professor. We have one last question, and then we'll have um, Gonzalo and Jorge to, to tell you a, a few things, and then we'll finish. Uh, Edvaldo Moita from Brazil. Are you there, Edvaldo? Yes, I am. Can you listen? Perfect. Yeah. Obrigado. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Paulson, for your wonderful presentation and, and Harvard for the organization. Uh, Professor Paulson, you reconstructed the Kelsenian difference between being empowered to impose the sanction and being commanded to impose the sanction. We know that when talking about efficacy, Kelsen says that an efficacy of a norm is seen when the norm is observed, obeyed, and applied. So we have an obedience on the one hand in application on the other. I would like to know more about the inefficacy of a norm. Yeah? So we can say inefficacy in terms of disobedience, uh, a factual performance of a behavior that is performing a behavior that is a condition for a sanction. But how, and here is my question, how can we assess the inefficacy of a primary norm in terms of application? considering that application is not pure factual performance of a behavior, but also, so to use here, your in hit from right, a normative behavior. It shapes the norm, creates the norm, changes the norm, or even in the case of courts, decides that it is not the case to apply the norm. So how can we assess the inefficacy of primary norms in this sense? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, 
efficacy has always been a kind of stumbling block for Carlson because it doesn't fit, of course, very neatly into a pure theory of law. The uh, efficacy condition appears to take us back to the world uh, of facts, back to our naturalistic world. Um, insofar as Kilsen's primary norm is concerned, the boilerplate, the boilerplate on efficacy has it that the efficacy condition obtained, if the hypothetically formulated norm, the primary norm, the independent legal norm is applied. That's one ground for arguing that the efficacy condition obtains. The other ground, of course, is that if um, the prescription, the command in the penultimate line in the complete legal norm is followed, compliance, obedience with the norm, that also counts, of course, as um, uh, uh, satisfying the efficacy condition. Um, that is boilerplate and people who have talked about efficacy primarily in the sociology of law, where I find more interesting work than in uh, the work of the, the philosophers. Um, efficacy is talked about not so much in terms of Kelsen's boilerplate distinction between uh, compliance and application, but rather efficacy talked about in terms of the realization of legislative goals. That's one um, uh, motif in recent work on efficacy that the legal sociologist, Hubert Rotleitner, is an example in Germany, have uh, talked about it. And I find that fascinating. Um, you set out an entire um, statutory mechanism, uh, vastly complicated and uh, worked up over a long period of time. And now the question arises, well, how well does it work? And one looks at some point down the road at its efficacy, how well has this legislation uh, fared in realizing uh, the goals that the legislators had in mind in setting the whole thing down in the first place. Um, back to my first point, um, efficacy is of course a problem for Kelson because it does take us back to the world of fact. Um, and indeed you have something comparable to efficacy in moving from uh, say, uh, the, the gang of robbers to a legal system at some point, that unit proves to be so efficacious that we're now inclined to speak of it as a legal system. The efficacy condition for the validity of the legal system is satisfied here. We don't speak in English, as you know, about the efficacy of legal systems, but Kelsen does and others in uh, the European uh, jurisdiction speak about the efficacy of a legal uh, system. You're beginning there um, from a st factual standpoint. And in my own recent work on Kelsen, I've speculated about whether it's not appropriate to speak of two concepts of law. The familiar concept of law uh, reflecting a version of critical idealism Kantian transcendental philosophy, insofar as that's present in Kelsen's work. And of course, he tries to make a great deal of it. But then alongside that, a, another concept of law, uh, taking us back to the natural world. And um, there is a fair bit of textual material that would suggest that that concept of law too uh, gets a good bit of play in Kelsen. For example, the lawmakers begin with acts of will. And he's very clear in talking about acts of will as empirical phenomena. And in fact, in a famous exchange with uh, Carl Schmidt way back in 1931, Schmidt tries to trap kills and into granting that constitutional review counts as something political in nature. And Schmidt figures that if he can convince kills and that constitutional review is political in nature, then Kelsen has lost the argument. And Kelsen turns right around and says, all of law is political. But that's not something that stems from the pure theory of law. That's something that stems from Kelsen's 
other concept of law, law as fact. And I think a great deal can be developed there, um, though I'm just beginning on that front. Thank you very much for a good question. Uh -huh. Thank you very much, Professor Paulson. Um, I have a very, take it as a comment because it's coming from Italy, Stefano Citivares, and he's having a problem with his internet connection. So Professor Paulson, don't feel obliged to answer. I'm simply going to read his question and then I'll give the floor to Gonzalo and Jorge. Uh, Stefano Citivares from Italy. So today you have question from Australia to Brazil, literally including Barbados, Poland, and Italy. Uh, Professor Paulson, would you say that Kelsen last phase can be interpreted as a shift towards a form of legal realism? Thank you very much. And again, this question is coming from Stefano Citivarese in Italy. And before uh, you say anything, Professor Paulson, because I'm conscious about your time, um, Jorge and Gonzalo, do you want to uh, add anything? Jorge or Gonzalo, Jorge Fabra. So, so uh, I, I wanted just to, to add like a quick, quick question that, that, that I don't seem like a, a insistence of the point of primitive law a, a, in this sense. So there seems to be like two Kelsens and this seems to be at the core of the theory. When, when discussing primitive law in an off-sighted passage in the general theory of law and state, Kelsen says something like, uh, what is in common among primitive law, the law of the West Ashantis and the law of Switzerland is that it's a form of, it's a social technique that operates through coercion. So that seems to give rise to something like a, a, a during posing first theory of law. So the, in that sense, during posing takes prima, primacy. Everything that has during posing plus coercion is law. But in his response to Eldridge, as you rightly mentioned, he seems to imply that that is a legal system when you have officials and something more a, a complex structure of authority. So this seems to uh, to justify your second reading. So so uh, and you seems to be uh, uh, defending the second reading. But I would like to 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 hear your opinion on, on this first one. So how do we accommodate? Because Kelsen he does say something like the social technique of comment of guiding behavior with coercion seems to be the key that unites. Uh, uh, the law of Switzerland and the law of Ashantis. That, that's, that's, those are actually Kelsen's example. So, and this, this is the motivation of my question. There are, of course, elements in so-called primitive law that uh, are reflected in Kelsen's own theory. I think his work on primitive law uh, began because he was very interested in um, questions of punishment, questions of coercion, uh, one of the motifs in the primitive law that he develops at great length is, um, is um, a Vergeltung, retribution, uh, and how retribution comes about in a social context serving as a means of uh, coercion. Um, but the work on that front, and he was already collecting data on so-called primitive primitive law in the late 1920s, worked further on the motif in Cologne and took the uh, materials with him to Geneva and then published in the late 1930s, or I beg your pardon, didn't really publish. He completed this uh, great big book on, uh, uh, in translation, retribution and causality. <laughs> pardon me, but I think this was large Kelsen's effort to try to determine the origins of law, what kinds of concerns on the part of primitive people led them to um, engage in retribution. And um, he talks a great deal about how um, the law was actually uh, a reflection of societal norms. And now we were using norm in this old fashioned sense before um, 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 the analytical jurists got a hold of it. Um, but it is not to be confused, I think, with his mature legal theory. It's rather part of an historical background. He was also very interested, and this is, I think, part of the same phenomenon. He was very interested in how people <coughs> 
uh, could believe things that um, we in our modern secular world regard as outrageous. How is it that people could believe, and this is one of his examples, that by following some dictator uh, um, and you have uh, indices of the dictator's behavior, nothing good is going to come of this. But the people are there following the dictator to the end. Why so? He was interested in questions like that. Why do people um, uh, spend the better part of their lives adhering to various religious persuasions when by Kelsen's lights, none of this made any very good sense? And I think this set of questions was what motivated Kelsen to get interested in primitive law. But as I say, and I'll stop here, this is part of Kelsen's effort to, to work as, a, as an, in the field of anth um, anthropology or anthology uh, in a, with an eye to trying to determine the, the background of the law as distinct from what a modern system looks like. Thank you, Gonzalo. I, I just, I uh, just... The, the other question is very interesting. Kelsen's move to what uh, I think the questioner called legal realism. Is that right? Hey, correct. Yes, from Stefano Citivares. A very good memory, Professor. Yes. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm very interested in this. I think um, you're right on the money insofar as the move to the so called Schmidt in 1960 and following is concerned. It seems to me very clear, very clear that Kelsen throws overboard the entire Kantian apparatus. Um, and this is perhaps most clear in his abandonment of the uh, Kantian inspired basic norm in 1962, two years earlier in the course of his uh, exchange with Ulrich Klug, the Cologne and later Hamburg uh, legal theorist, he rejects the idea of any application of logic to the law. Uh, and these factors together um, represent a transformation in his view about the nature of law and what remains, I'm entirely in agreement with your label, what remains is a kind of legal realism or if you will, legal empiricism in the late 1930s, in what I call the first round in rejecting um, Kelsenian classical positivism, Kelsen not only abandoned Kant, late 1930s, the publication of this great big book on primitive law, but flirted quite openly with David Hume. And then in short order, 1941, 1942, he was once again back defending um, the classical uh, pure theory. Second round, 1960 and following, he again abandons the Kantian view. And again, there's something like a flirtation with Humean empiricism. And there are also uh, psychologistic elements in the late theory kills and earlier was very clear on um, the need to eliminate psychologism along with naturalism, kills and the Kantian. And now in the late theory, uh, psychologistic elements are present. And that too tends to underscore the view that this in it is an entirely different uh, bag of tricks. Uh, and your label legal realism, I think, is in no way, shape, or form misleading. Gonzalo? I have a, a small question. Uh, most of part of, of your paper was about the problem of the egg, it was about the egg chicken problem in Kelsen. Yeah, about the what? About the egg chicken problem or the chicken egg problem. Uh, is what is which is the, the fundamental normative uh, category in, in, in law? The problem between um, uh, competence and obligation. So my my question is very, very naive. Why is this problem important for Kelsen? Well, I think it takes me back to one of the 
most conspicuous programmatic elements in the theory, he was well nigh obsessed with the idea of rendering the law scientific. Legal science had been a, a disgrace from his standpoint in the 19th century. And he, Hans Pilsen, wants to make something respectable of legal science. We want to recreate legal science as something that counts alongside other sciences, uh, that counts in a serious way. And the first great task then for Kilsen is to drive a sharp wedge between the law and morality. So while obligation in the early work, Main Problems 1911, is the overriding normative modality, he is uh, determined from that early point on to drive a wedge between everything that's associated with the imperative and with the obligation stemming from it uh, and what he regards as um, a defensible view of the law. And that I think finds its most dramatic statement. Um, and I know I'm repeating myself from my talk that finds its most dramatic statement in the 1930s where we have this drastic shift to empowerment. Now he's free of what everyone else regards as the fundamental normative modality obligation. He's free of that and therefore free of the connotations that um, a lot of people cannot uh, uh, free themselves of uh, when the question of the nature of legal obligation arises. Does that help or not? Or not? Please be honest. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Paulson. And I'm hoping, is Bonnie there with you? Um, Bonnie has gone back to her room. Uh, <laughs> She's uh, well, following the events of the late afternoon with great interest and greets all of you warmly. And, um, but she's not here at the moment, so I'm not- well, On behalf of, um, you know, Jorge, Gonzalo, all Jewish North, uh, William Lucy had to leave now, Josh Howitt, and, and again, I'm just, you know, the, the face here, but we are many, many people behind Jewish North. So it's, it's the second place we have the, the, the pleasure to have you here the first time at Durham University and now online. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you all uh, our participants. We'll have a very short break. I'm going to stop recording. Before we go, Professor, do you want to say anything before I stop recording? Well, I simply want to thank, uh, first of all, uh, my hosts, uh, Jorge and uh, uh, Gonzalo, who I know have put a lot of work into this. Gonzalo uh, edited the film's text and added a great deal to it with uh, his insertions of bits and pieces of the text, even uh, portraits of some of the major figures. I'm very grateful to Gonzalo, grateful Jorge for uh, your promoting the Kelsen Roundtable uh, generally. And then I want to thank all of the participants, uh, all of you who turned out this afternoon for coming. I'm uh, grateful and I'm moved by the interest in these esoteric matters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop recording now. Uh